That doesn't get old, especially if you're a Star Wars fan. Do we have any Star Wars fans in here? Yes. Rick Hornfield, I was actually looking up to look for you. I, knew, I was hoping you were here. No pun intended. Um, hi. Good morning. I'm excited. I hope you are too. Turn to your neighbor. Say this is going to be good. Yeah. Yeah, I heard the 9 o'clock too, and I would just like to say I agree with everything that guy said. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, good morning, Journey Center, live streamers. I'm, sometimes I forget to acknowledge there's, there's people out there that watch us. Did you know that, Scott? There's people out there that watch us. It's so exciting. It's so good. So we're, we're, I know we miss you. Um, if you're somewhat local, we'd love to actually get to meet you. Um, and if you're not, bless you, and thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm going to be in Matthew 4 pretty predominantly this morning, so if you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, um, you, can, uh, you can go ahead and turn there or scroll there, open the app there, whatever works for you. And, um, and some of you repeat after me, your words are so powerful that they will kill or give life. Cool. Babe, can I? Thanks. Who believes that? As the prophet Dave King would say, no, we don't. Um, the reason I say that is um, if we believe that, I think we'd be more careful with our words. I would even venture to say, if, if we knew what God knew about the power of our words, we'd probably speak about 10% of the time. <laughs> just being real. And, um, and I, I'd, I'd love to just kind of maybe take us on a journey this morning, if that's possible. It is my joy and honor to serve you. I always love getting to, um, to just release a word and have some fun, just digging some things out in scripture and, and seeing what God has for us this morning. Your words are so powerful that they will kill or give life. Uh, the, um, one of the things it says in Hebrews 11, just two or three verses in, it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. And so one of the things that we need to understand about the power of our words is um, the connection, I'm going to get here a little bit later, the connection of our words to the spirit in which we bring them. So if you go back, if you scroll back to Genesis 1 and you look at how this whole journey called, in this experiment called humanity began, then we find out in Genesis 1 that there was Holy Spirit hovering over the chaos, hovering over the deep. There was darkness, there was chaos, it was void. It was, it was bereft of life, it was bereft, it was, it was, there was nothing there of substance that you and I would recognize as anything discernible. And so here's Holy Spirit hovering over, and, and it was the combination of the Spirit hovering over and the word from heaven that came through that Spirit that ignited light. God said, let there be light, and there was. And so we understand that when uh, a word, when, when a word comes forth and it's empowered by a spirit, and that can be on the wrong side too, that, um, that it, can, it can bring life or it can bring death. It can bring light or it can bring darkness. And it, and it is in, incumbent on us as believers. Somebody say, turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. that's you. To actually begin to recognize that what comes out of our mouth matters. There's a gravity about this because even Jesus said, um, we'll give an account for every idle word spoken. <laughs> I don't know about you. I'm convicted every time I read that scripture because I'm like, every idle word spoken? I don't even know how many idle words I spoke this morning. <laughs> Off the cuff, wrong spirit, wrong heart, wrong attitude, and, and uh, everyone, like you got to multiply that out and you're, we're going to be sitting with Jesus for a while. Jesus the accountant. You know, like, picture the green visor and be like, okay, so let's go back to January 17th of 2003. There were 327 words that you said that day that were idle. We're going to go through each one, one at a time. I know, listen, listen, I promise you there's good news. I'm just saying, what, what, I, what I want to just, I, I just want to point us to a few things this morning. Is that cool? This is just brother to brother, brother to sister, brother to mom, brother to dad. I just want to point us to some things this morning. And maybe have us consider 
tomorrow maybe we don't spout off at the mouth as much as we did today. Wouldn't that be something? It just everybody. Okay, all right. So we've had some uh, we've had some memory scriptures over the last couple weeks. Um, how many of you have been enjoying? How many of you have been here for more of our sword series than just this morning? Awesome, most of you, great. That's so good. So Scott started us off week one. Somebody say we. Um, with spirit wars, and we uh, our memory verse landed at 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, English Standard Version. We're going to go through it slowly, see how many of us remember. That includes me because some of the wording I get a little funky off. So here we go. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Yeah. If you knew that, somebody say, I knew that. Awesome. So our apostle knew that, and that's, that's exciting. At least, at least he's got that one. Then last week, um, how many people were here for Steve Backlund last week? Yeah. Come on. He's just out of control. And uh, so our memory verse, he didn't spend a ton of time on it, but I want to highlight it just for a second here. And I think this is on your cards, right? You guys all get cards and, you know, it's on there. For he who would love life, this is 1 Peter 3.10, World English Bible. For he who would love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Wouldn't it be awesome if our media and our government just took that verse to heart? Hallelujah. That'd be great. That'd be so good. All right. Fake news, fake news. It's all, it's all good. All right. So. Spirit War, Scott led us off um, and reminded us, uh, one of the things that I love about the book that was featured that week called Spirit Wars, Chris Valentin says this, it's alarming how many people, how many saints, how many believers don't understand that we don't inhabit the earth, we cohabit the earth. Pause for effect. We don't inhabit the earth, we cohabit the earth. I'm not talking about the animal kingdom. I'm talking about the fact that we actually cohabit this place with an invisible realm that is full of angelic and demonic warfare. Largely, you and I go, through, go about our days fairly unaware of it. Now, the more we learn and the more, and the more we are led by the Spirit, the more we become aware and acclimated to the things of the Spirit and how we're to engage warfare when necessary. But I'll give you, I'll give you for instance, um, have you ever walked into a department store or, or a store of any kind and you instantly became tired? You, you, you actually, you walked through and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted. I got to go home and take a nap. And then you left the store and you're like, I, I, I guess I'm not going to go home right now. And you're fine. What happened was, is you actually came into, you actually came into an area that the leadership or the authority in that store is actually under the influence of a contrary spirit. And one of the ways, one of the ways that the enemy works is to fatigue. It says um, to to make the saints weary. And so when you when you are in, when you're coming under certain influences, it's not always you. Sometimes we just need to be kind of woken up to awareness that like there there are other, there are other things happening in the airways right now. I mean, even just think about, think about that from a scientific perspective. Right now in this room, there are, there are radio waves and electromagnetic waves, and you think about that whole spectrum. Our visual capacity only picks up Roy G. Biv. <laughs> but, it, but I mean, just think about that alone. How much do we not see? How much do we not see the wireless bandwidth just flowing through this room right now? Similar in the things of the Spirit. And in fact, a lot of those things are overlapped. So, we need to come to an understanding, my gosh, we don't just inhabit the earth, we cohabit the earth. And when we can begin to step into that understanding, we can realize, oh wow, if I'm driving down the road and all of a sudden I'm prompted, I have this, this, this influential thought, man, I should, just, I should run my car off the road into this tree, that thought's not you. And can I tell you, you're not going crazy. One of, the things that, one of the things that we're coming to understand is that anything that is invisible is inherently spiritual. Okay. It's getting quiet. That was week one. Week two. Somebody say, say it, Steve. 
Steve came in, dropped all kinds of revelation bombs. I'm just going to repeat a few of them here. The future is in the mouths of intentional speakers. I love that. If you ever get around to reading James 3, James 3 is one of my, kind of one of my uh, keystone scriptures. I love going to it on a regular basis for a variety of reasons. But one of the things that I love about James 3 is it says that he or she that can actually bridle your tongue, <laughs> some of you in this room, I'm so sorry, you're, you're going to get convicted. Um, so he or she that can bridle their tongue can control their whole body. How great it would feel to actually be feeling like you're in control of your life. And, and, and James, is, James, James pops this wisdom from above and he says, if you can get a hold of your tongue, because what's happening? If you can get a hold of your tongue, it says, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you can get a hold of your tongue, that means you're probably getting, uh, getting a hold of your thoughts and your heart intentions. And if you can get a hold of your heart and your thought intentions, you could shift those into a good spot. If you can recognize that you don't actually have to say everything that comes to your mind. It's like... There's, a, there's an old prophetess that used to say, it's tight, but it's right. The future is in the mouths of intentional speakers. He also said this, we can't change our life without changing our words. We can't change our life without changing our words. If, as James 3 also says, if the tongue is the rudder of the ship of my life, Okay, it likens the tongue to a couple different things. I'm just going to focus in on the rudder. I don't know, I'm not a nautical guy, but what I do know is that the rudder is proportionally a lot smaller than the rest of the ship. And so it says the rudder is just a small device, and yet it, it, it will completely change the direction of where the ship is going. So if I can get a hold of my tongue, which is the rudder of my life, then I can actually direct my life in the right way. I can direct my life in the wrong way. James actually kind of hones in on the negative, and he says, see how great uh, a forest is set, set of fire, like a blaze by one spark, one thing. <laughs> so if that's true in the negative, that's also true in the positive. How much more can I ignite the course of my life with the glory of God if I'm actually aligning my words with the will of heaven? Yeah, Sean, that's a good, that's good. It's, it's really good. I really liked that. That's a nice shirt too. All right. It's all good. He said this, faith is believing better when the circumstances have not yet changed. Faith is believing better when the circumstances have not yet changed, okay? Some of us, is, yeah, I gotta hit this. Some of us this morning came in with circumstances that haven't changed. Release your faith. Release your faith. There's a hope level that's rising in the room this morning, and I'm not just, I'm not just quoting the song. I just Honestly, if you ask Dave Buckner, he chose the song for this morning, and he's like, I didn't know that this was going to be a big thing. It's, it's real. There's a hope level rising in the body of Christ right now, and, it, and, it's, and it's at your invitation to go ahead and ride that wave and, and get on top. Get on top of the surfboard. Get on, top, get on top of the wave and realize that God's got better for you tomorrow than you've been experiencing. Mix, mix what you're experiencing with faith. Look, with, look through the eyes of heaven. Um, I had another word during, um, during worship that I wanted to release. I felt like there was somebody in the room, uh, I need to break this word off of you, that you were told, I believe as a young person, I'm gonna say teen years, maybe younger, that um, your mom was trash and you're trash. And I wanna break that off. And I feel like it's a young woman or, or, or maybe a young adult or woman in general. I really wanna break off that word. Can I just pray that? Right now, I really feel like that's for someone this morning. So I just, um, I break all those words of condemnation. And I remind you, uh, we were singing that song of the redeemed. You're not, you're not a five cent recyclable. You were worth, you alone, you alone were worth the blood of Jesus being spilled at Calvary. And so I release value over that woman or women this morning. I release hope over wom uh, that woman or women this morning. Um, and I say, your daddy doesn't make trash. Your capital D-A-D-D-Y does not make trash. He makes princesses, he makes queens, he makes royalty, and there isn't anything that he didn't make and didn't say, it's good. And he looked at you and he said, very good. So I just break off that lie right now in Jesus' name. Amen. That's good. It's really good. Cool. Um, 
And if that's you, and I, I, would, I, I seriously would love to meet you if, that, if that's you this morning, and I would love to just even pray, pray further with you after service. Steve said, we get our identity not from what we've done, but why, what we were created to do. Isn't that so future looking? It's so forward looking. We don't get our identity from what we've done. How many of you do not want your identity from what you've done? <laughs> Go on. But why, what, by what we were created to do what we were created to do. It says in Ephesians 2 that you and I were created for good works in Christ Jesus. Meaning, the degree to which you and I um, come into union with Christ will actually position us to do exceptional works on his behalf. Somebody say, I'm exceptional. Yeah. Um, He also said this, where you're going, you can't say that anymore. I'll say that again. He said, where you're going, you can't say that anymore. Listen, there's, a, there's an opportunity that you and I have in this season to be promoted in the things of God. And when I say in the things of God, I don't just mean in the church. I mean all of the things that you are called to do in your life, all the things that you're called to be in your life, the Lord has invited us into a promotion. But one of the things that we understand about scripture is that every time he promotes us, there's a new level of responsibility and accountability that also comes with that promotion. And, and for us, um, one of the ways, I wouldn't say it's the only way, but one of the ways that manifests is that you and I become much more accountable for our words. Let me take you old school. So let's go back to the book of Exodus. And when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, um, it, they, were, they were popular, they were famous for doing two things, grumbling and complaining. Um, and, and I mean, there's, there's whole scriptures in the New Testament that talked about Massa and Meribah and don't test them. Uh, and, and we understand that it was, it, it, it was a noted quality of theirs that they would grumble and complain. Every time they didn't have water, give us water. Every time they didn't have food, give us quail. And it's like the quail was like up to their knees. Yuck. Be like, I, listen, I've had some good quail dishes, but I don't want to be swimming in it. You know what I mean? I just, that's, that's not, that's not my jam. I mean, even Dave, Dave wants to hunt. He doesn't want to have to like swim in it, you know? So. So we find out they were really good at grumbling and complaining. Now, listen, I understand. Nobody in here is really known for grumbling and complaining. I'm not saying that. But just in case, just in case, just in case you know someone that deals with this, I'd just like to impart this word to you this morning. When, when their destiny, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump off what Lisa's saying here. Their destiny, they were supposed to go into the promised land. They weren't supposed to just cross one river or one lake. They were supposed to cross two. And they only crossed one. And the reason for that is they wouldn't shut their mouths while they were in the wilderness. They wouldn't. And here's the thing. Because every time we grumble and complain, we're simply showing how much we don't trust God. I said it and I felt it. Like you ever have something like really good come out of your mouth and you're like, oh, that was for me for me. It came out of my mouth, but that was for me. Yeah, because every time they grumbled and complained, they just stopped trusting that God was going to help them out. And so we've got the nation of Israel at one level of status and promotion, and then we've got Moses. Now, this is fascinating. Moses is leading these people. There were times where God was like, I'm going to kill them. Moses was like, hey, 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 let me remind you how good you are. And... (laughs) And so there were times where Moses really had it. Like he, he, re- he really had the heart of God for the people he was leading. And then there was this one occasion. He got ticked at the people for grumbling and complaining again. And so God says, um, instead of hitting that rock like you did last time and water poured forth from it, this time I want you to speak to the rock instead. And in his anger, he hit the rock. Now the first time nothing happened. The second time, in God's grace, he actually released the water from the rock. But that one act, listen, months and years of grumbling and complaining from the people. Moses does one thing at a higher level of authority that is contrary to the the raw obedience of God. And God's like, yeah, I can't let you go in. Listen, he was ready. He was ready to at least take Moses in. He was ready to at least take some of the leadership in. I mean, like, how do you know? How many of you know? Like Joshua and Caleb, that's a that's a stressful life. Like you're the only two who have the right view of the promised land, and you have to wait around with the grumbling and complainers to die off before you can actually go in. That like that's 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 a raw deal. 
sermon for another time. Uh, but here's Moses, and simply because he, it, uh, what to you and I would seem like a small disobedience. It didn't seem like that big a deal. But small things become big to God the higher up we go in this thing of promotion. So that's why I say, there's an opportunity on our house right now to move into new places of authority. And I'm talking about, not, like I said, not just in the house. I'm talking about in our workplaces, in the influence that we have in the lives of our families, in the lives of our peers, in the lives of our um, the fellow students, if you're in college, et cetera. But where we're going, we can't continue to say the same things we were saying in the previous season. All right. Lastly, I love this. Steve has said it on multiple occasions. He said this. He said, Jesus didn't think his way out of the wilderness. He spoke his way out. Um, (laughs) I promise I'm not jamming you up if it's you because I don't spend enough time on Facebook to know if it's you or not. Um, But like, you know, you always see the, um, my thoughts are with you. Or um, good vibes only, please. Uh, and, um, and that's cool, but at some point you got to say something. Yeah. And um, good thinking alone will not actually take us where we're supposed to go. At some point, <laughs> at some point we're going to have to say something. And, um, and as we're going to find out pretty soon here, it's going to be uber important if we're actually going to hold our own against the... Um, the mission of the enemy. So, somebody say, today. Yeah. We got the showdown throwdown. So, um, I'll be honest, you know, we've been, we've been talking about this for weeks. Um, Lisa and I had our throwdown this last week. Um, that's the reason I'm standing here and she's not. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, we found out, um, if you don't know, Lisa has a lot going on right now. There's just a lot. <laughs> that was a joke. It's okay to laugh. Um, and so, uh, so she graciously just said, hey, why don't you take this and turn with this this week, and we'll catch you next time. Uh, so, so bear with me, because um, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go somewhere. Go ahead and um, open to Matthew 4. And as you're opening to Matthew 4 or scrolling to Matthew 4 or getting your apps open to Matthew 4, um, I want to um, I wanna preface this by saying... Uh, we have an opportunity to not read scripture through a academic or literary lens. If we, th- if we actually read it through the lens of an experience or through the lens of this actually happened, that would have been cool to watch. I, I don't know if any of you ever read you know, stories like Elijah at Mount Carmel. <laughs> if you don't know, um, let, me, let, me, let me kind of paint this out real quick. So there's, you're alone. You're the one prophet of God that's actually still standing up to the demonic um, uh, and, and just evil um, authorities of the day. And it's you, and uh, on the mountain across from you is about 850 false prophets, and each one of you has a job. Uh, you're, all, you're, you're both going to create a bonfire, only you can't light it. It's on whoever your God is to light it. And so here's Elijah sets up, sets up the wood, sets up the fire pit, okay, 850 prophets of Baal, they set theirs up, they start dancing around, they start cutting themselves, they're shouting out, nothing's happening. To add insult to injury, Elijah's like, hey, bring me a bunch of water, douse that thing. Now, mind you, there's two things happening here. One, they're in the middle of a drought, so... so just, just the idea, I mean, they could, they could look at the wood wrong and it's gonna burst into flame. But he's like, douse it. Now, the, the, to really add insult to injury, they're in the middle of a drought. He takes their most precious resource in that season and he's like, douse it. Insult. One, 850. Elijah calls down fire from heaven. <sighs> takes the whole sacrifice right up. This is what I'm talking about. Like, this is real. It's not a cute story. Because cute would have been like, oh, the nation of Israel was like, our eyes are opened. You're amazing. No, no, no. The next thing that happens is Elijah takes out his sword and he hacks to death all 850 prophets. The warriors in the room are like, Hur! that's right. <laughs> Gonna leave that there. 
It's okay. Jesus reframed our strategy in the New Testament. All right. So I invite you to kind of look at this from a real lens rather than just a bunch of words on a page here. Matthew 4, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward, he was hungry. How many of you have ever fasted for four hours and then you, you're actually hungry? He's like, it's a, scripture says 40 days, 40 nights, and afterward, he was hungry. My gosh. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written. Someone say, it is written. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, if you have your um, uh, memory verse cards for today, go ahead and pull those out. Let's get those. Let's, let's get, get this into our verbiage. If you're, um, this is the NIV version, if we're memorizing this. It is written. Someone say, it is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Cool, I get it. All of, all right, all of you keto specialists out there, like you, you read Man Shall Not Live on Bread Alone and you're like, that's right. <laughs> healthy fats, healthy proteins, cocaine, just go like, get the greens in there. That's right, not bread alone. Yep, I get it. It's all good. But on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. All right, let's keep on going. Now, and I'm gonna come back to that because there's another word that I like in there because it, it, you know, strokes my teacher phony bone there. Verse five, then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands, they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to, them, said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written. Somebody say, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Somebody say, yay. yay. Yeah. Ends well. All's well that ends well. All right. Whew. So let's back up first. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So funny because to us, a couple chapters later, when Jesus is um, giving his Our Father prayer, um, he says in there, and lead us not into temptation. <laughs> it's like, I would prefer they not have to go through what I just went through. All right. Just saying, whatever. Um, we've got to set this scene a little bit because... What is happening here in scripture not only really happened, but it's more epic than the scene we just saw on the screen a few minutes ago. It's so fascinating to me that before Jesus really began the main thrust of his ministry, he went toe to toe with the devil before he started. It's like, it's, you know, most movies, uh, culminate with the epic battle between good and evil. This one actually started before, before the punchline, before you know, before anything really got started. And so we have this Saruman versus Gandalf moment. We have this Kylo Ren versus Way. This is Dumbledore versus Voldemort. I mean, this is this is as light dark as it gets in this moment, and they are, they're taking their swords, and they are wielding these things. Now, what's fascinating right, right off the bat is, and honestly, um, I'm gonna be honest with you, this revelation didn't hit me until just the last 48 hours, couldn't tell you when, but it was really recent. We look at that scripture and we think, it was Jesus versus the devil, but he wasn't alone. It says the spirit led him into the wilderness. I mean, it's one thing. Here's the thing. Jesus versus the devil, no contest. Jesus, Jesus can call down two other archangels who have the same uh, level of power, for lack of a better word. He could have called down Gabriel and Michael and been like, just trample on them for a while. But he decided to take them on himself. And so there's something even just in that. But here's Jesus after the devil, but who's he empowered by? Holy Spirit. 
two members of the Godhead against one fallen archangel. It's no contest. Guys, this, this, is, this, was, never, <laughs> this was never a nail biter. A- ain't no one looking at the scene. In fact, I'm like, did the angels show up with popcorn? Like, I- I'm wondering, like, this is going to be so awesome. Like, we already kicked him out once, and now Jesus, like, Jesus has stripped off all of his glory, all of the access to, to just straight on kingdom resources. I mean, just, anyway. And he's become a man, but he's empowered by Holy Spirit, so it's these two versus Satan. I mean, the angels have to be like, pass me the milk, duds. This is going to be awesome. Led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. It's fascinating. Why wasn't he hungry during the 40 days and 40 nights? The next encounter actually gives us some of what's happening. He said, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is a fascinating thing. I'm going to drop this and I'm going to move. Is it possible that one word from God has more life-sustaining power inside of it than 40 days worth of food? Even in the physical. It says afterward he became hungry. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What preceding word had he just gotten? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Sorry, if I, didn't, I didn't give you the preamble. If you traced back to Matthew 3, right before this being led into the wilderness, he had come up out of the waters of baptism, and we get this one flashing moment of the Trinity all in one place. We've got Jesus coming up out of the waters of baptism. We've got Father from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And you have Holy Spirit descending on Jesus like a dove. And he remained with him from that day forward. And it says, I believe it's in Matthew 9, that the government of God will be upon his shoulder. What happened? Where Holy Spirit goes, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that's the kingdom of God, goes the government of heaven. Wherever Holy Spirit is, the government of heaven goes with that, with that person. Okay. So now what we've got is we've got a clash of kingdoms. We've got light versus dark, and it's on. It's on. On And then one of the most fascinating things, honestly, if you consider, uh, sorry, side note, side teacher note, little tip. (laughs) Here's a pro tip, Nate. When you're reading the Bible, one of the things that you can do to actually gain revelation and pull things out of scripture that you might not have seen otherwise is to ask yourself not just what's being written or said, what's not being said, what's not being done. Okay, in this case, here's a profound example. Because the devil, in his presumption, of course, is the first one to strike. Listen, if I'm going up against Jesus, I am not going to be the first one to throw a punch. All right, I'm just saying. But it says, the temper came to him and said, if you're the son of God, command that these stones become bread. I'm going to come back to that point in a moment, but look what happens next. He answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. One of the things that you're going to find if you read this chapter is every single answer that Jesus had for the devil was a scripture plucked from the book of Deuteronomy. I know some of you are like, you should never take scripture out of context. Jesus did all the time. I mean all the time. Okay? I'm not saying you should preach that way. I'm just saying he did all the time, especially in matters of spiritual warfare. Check how he handles the Pharisees. Anyway, so here comes, here comes the devil. Okay, so you guys get in the picture. Let's go back to the Star Wars picture. Kylo Ren. Right? All right, so the devil has blazed up his sword, and he, come, he comes to strike, and here, and here Jesus comes. I know, I'm really good at this. I've had a lot of years of practice. And right, Rick, I just, I've, yeah. So he blazed up his sword. I know, and Nate, you don't like movies, but now you're really gonna go watch these. And, and so he blazes up his sword, and what happens? And he's able to parry. He's able to hold off that movement of the enemy in his life. So much more to this, bear with me. Somebody say, it is written. I'm fascinated. You and I should be utterly fascinated. Jesus could have done anything, said anything, released, uh, released angels to come and just pound on Satan. And what does he do? 
he refers to the ancient books of the law. He pulls one scripture from the ancient books of the law, breathes it because that's the proceeding word from God. He breathes that through the empowerment of Holy Spirit and that's the thing that unseats this particular moment and sends him on his heels. Somebody say, it's written. So, now what's fascinating to me, and I'm gonna, like I said, I gotta drop this and leave it because there's so much more to cover. What that shows me is that scripture is not some dusty book that sits on a shelf. Scripture, when utilized in the leading of the Holy Spirit, when breathed again upon in a moment, becomes something, and he, all he said was, it is written. What's he saying? At one point, this was just a spoken, released word from the mouth of God. But as soon as Moses or Samuel or whomever, Isaiah, as soon as they set that to paper, as soon as they set that to a scroll, the sound of that moment was moved into the earth in a permanent way. And now we open the scrolls and we, can, and we can now hear the same sounds of heaven come through that scroll and now I can use it. Man, I've got a weapon. And now I can actually hold off the enemy when he's making an advance in my life. Did you notice in the movie that Ray was kind of on her heels, very defensive until he, he's like, you need a teacher. I can show you the ways of the force, right? And all of a sudden, the force. What's the translation for you and I? The spirit of God. What happened was she paused in that moment. She's holding that spot. You see her close her eyes, and it's almost like, and you gotta just kind of imagine this because you don't see it visually, but it's almost like you, you allow your spirit to just expand in that moment and connect with the reality of God. What's his leading? What's he doing? What's he saying? What's his will? And then all of a sudden, where she was on the defensive, now she's on the offense. Interception, first down. We've got the ball. Okay, come on, Benny Johnson, happy intercessor people. We've got the ball, and now we're running down the field. And from that moment on, Kylo Ren is now on the defensive. Guys, same thing happened right in the scripture. Here's what happened. Man, I can't get to, oh, man. All right, I'm going to run. Same thing happened to the devil. Attack. <laughs> Upload. <laughs> Deuteronomy 6.8. Okay, into the breath of the Spirit of God. The government is on his shoulders and the inspiration right there. Word, the, the word from heaven spoken through Holy Spirit. Boom, now we've got, now we've got not just, it's not, a, it's not a stalemate, guys. It's not a stalemate because the next thing you see in verse five is then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. What happened? He lost the battle on this natural ground. What was he trying to get him to do? Feed himself. He lost the battle of temptation with Jesus being able to attend to his own physical needs. He lost that battle. He couldn't get him on the first heaven, so we're gonna go to the second heaven level. Literally goes to a higher elevation. The devil has to backtrack. Now I'm gonna pull Jesus up here, set him on a temple. What happens? Now he quotes scripture. Guys, be sobered by this thought. The devil knows scripture. And I'll take the sting off this next one. He knows scripture better than I do. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He knows scripture, but he's the father of lies. How do we know when the devil is lying? Every time he opens his mouth. So even truth, even something that's true, delivered from the wrong spirit, is not truth. So this is, why, this is why Paul picks up this later and he says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Meaning even the Bible, even scriptures used poorly, used sourced from the wreck, wreck, spirit will actually reach, wreak destruction, not life. So what happens? It takes him up on a higher position and now there's a new, a new leg to this battle that happens. 
He says, if you're the son of God, he's still questioning his identity. He says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He'll give his angels charge of you in their hands. They'll bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. What's happened? He's going, okay, if I can't tempt you on the natural realm, I'm going to take you into a second heaven realm where the angelic and demonic warfare is. And I got to see if I can beat you here. Can I tempt you? Can I tempt you with the idea of validating who you are by calling supernatural intervention into place? Okay, all right. Jesus said to him, what were the first three words that he said to him this time? It is written. Again, plucks a word from Deuteronomy, Spirit of God. <laughs> again, able to hold him off, and it's not, again, it's not a stalemate. Look what happens next. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. Um, some people think he, uh, the devil actually took him to the top of Mount Everest and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. There's a French term I picked up from a um, popular television show a few years ago called White Collar. Um, the French term is pis aller, and it means the move of last resort. How do we know that the devil was on his last legs? He was on his last legs. Because the devil has always wanted to be worshipped. He's always wanted to be in charge. He's always, he's always wanted to unseat God. So what does he do? This is his move of last resort. He takes him up on an exceedingly high mountain. What's happened? He's figured out, okay, I know you're the son of man. I know you're the son of God. I know what you're here for. Up until this moment, up until this time, I've had complete authority and dominion over everything in the earth. That's why Jesus in John 14 calls him the ruler of the world. He's never the ruler of the world after, after, the, after the Gospels. He's only referred to as the prince of the power of the air later, or the accuser of the brethren. He's never given the designation ruler of the world. He knows that Jesus has come back to pull the authority and the influence right out of his hands. And so what does he do? He says, okay, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the world for all time and their glory. And the only thing you need to do is bow down and worship me. In scripture, side note, in scripture, almost every time you see the word worship, it's akin to the word serve. If you'll just bow down and serve me, if you'll bow down and agree with me that I should be in charge, if you'll, if you'll, if you'll just do this small little thing, Jesus says, it's written. There was a sound, Satan, that was released a thousand years ago. It's written. It's written, it's done. It's been inscribed. My daddy spoke it, he breathed it, and I'm reminding you of it right now. You're gonna worship one and him only. So I'm not gonna take your shortcut. Side note, the enemy always wants you to take shortcuts to your destiny. It's how he gets you to agree with him. It's how he, how he ensnares us. He's like, there's only one. And it's going to be tough, but I'll take the cross. Because in just about three years from now, I'm going to disarm all of your powers and principalities. I'm going to disarm all of your rulers. I'm going to take away every single lie and bondage that you've put against my people. And it says in Colossians, I'm going to nail it to the cross. And I'm going to cancel out that certificate of debt. Somebody's in here this morning that feels indebted to their old life that feels absolutely helpless to have a better Monday tomorrow. Because you, you've, you've, you've allowed yourself to succumb to the lie that it's just been this way for so long, I can't possibly get out of this. Yes, you can. Because what Jesus did on the cross is he took, see the, the enemy is gonna hold all of your bad things from your past. He's got them written. Do you know he's got a, he's got a, he's got a scroll to? The enemy has what's called a certificate of debt. He's actually written down all the nasty things you've done. He's written down all the false words. He's written down all the lies that you've believed, all the things you've been in bondage to. And it says in Colossians 2 that Jesus took the certificate of debt, all of those things that had been written against you in, and that could have been used against you in the courts of heaven, and he nailed them to the cross, and he wiped them clean with the blood. Boom, done, gone. Somebody say, it is written. It's written. Yeah, it's written. All right. 
It says, that then the devil left him. I think Luke reports that the devil left him until an opportune time. And behold, angels came and ministered to him. <sighs> you guys okay? I'm going to land the plane. I'm going to land the plane with some practicals here. Because I'd love, I'd love to just, you know, have us be empowered with how, how this gets worked out tomorrow. I, I told the first service this too. I feel like, um, I feel like our church has an opportunity to enter into a renaissance in the Word, to have a rebirth in the fervor for the Scriptures. And and I, I hope I've illustrated this morning that the Scriptures they're not a dusty book. They're they're um, as great as Shakespeare is. Um, it, you can't you can't put them in the same breath. Um, as uh, as significant as Charles Dickens or pick your favorite author, whatever that is, they, they don't belong in the same breath. It's not just a book. And I feel like we have an opportunity to have a rebirth in our fervor for what God can speak to us and what God can reveal to us again in this book. Um, one of the one of the passions of this house is putting on raw display the goodness and the love of God. And so I wouldn't dare say that you can't come to know Jesus apart from this book, but I will say with some confidence that we can't grow in Jesus apart from this book. It's actually literally impossible according to the word. So I just want to encourage us. One of the things that we did this week is our featured resource in our, in our bookstore is the Bibles. So, and if you haven't got one already, um, I highly encourage you to check some of those out, but it doesn't have to be. You can go to Barnes & Noble. You can go, to, go, to the, um, go find Amelia at, the, um, at their cafe, get a latte, and then turn right, and you'll literally see a rows of Bibles right next, right next to them. Go online. Go to Amazon. Go to cbd.com. There, I mean, there's any number of things. You don't have to buy it here. From my heart to yours, let's get back into the Word. Let's get back to that source, that spring of life that's there. Every time, guys, every time I open this book, I'll find something, something the Lord will speak to me, something that will engage my heart. You've got your memory scriptures. Also want to encourage you, uh, there are... <laughs> There are so many Bible reading plans. Oh my gosh. If you've got a YouVersion Bible app or a Bible Gateway app, you can get onto one of those and just and just start. Sean, I don't know where to begin. It's okay, just start. Don't start in Numbers. Don't start in Lamentations, but just start, okay? Don't start in Ecclesiastes. It'll confuse you. Unless Spirit of God is like, go to Ecclesiastes, start reading. Like, he'll illuminate, but like, there are places to start, okay? And, but my goodness, start. Please, 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 for you, for your generations, start. There's so much there. So, so much there. Okay. I want to pray, and then um, then I'm just going to make a couple invitations, and we're out of here. Somebody say, it's written. Holy Spirit, we invite you back into the place of leadership in our lives. Jesus, we invite you to be enthroned in our hearts. Father of lights, I ask that you would release revelation to your people that they are light in the Lord. I ask that you would take us into a new season of pursuing your word. I ask for a a Psalm 1 anointing on this house that we would be those that would meditate on the law of the Lord day and night knowing that the reward of prospering in whatever we set our hands to do is right in front of them. I ask for uh, a 2 Timothy 3 anointing on this house that we would recognize the inspiration, the breath of heaven, the breath of God himself on the scripture 
to correct us, to teach us, to train us, to equip us, to make us adequate for every good work. God, I release over our hearts today that your word is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. We thank you for the light. We thank you for the revelation. Amen. Guys, this morning, I really feel like this. As the, um, I know Deb's going to be up here in a second. Prayer team, you can come on um, to the front here. I really feel like um, if you're in this room this morning and, um, and enough's been said or you've experienced enough that says, I don't want to leave this morning without knowing I'm right with God. And that's you. Maybe it's, it's, it's either I've never made the confession of I trust God with everything that I have, with everything that I am. Or you're coming back to a spot of I've been away from the church for a while. I've been away from my walk with Jesus. Um, but, the, but the presence of God that's in this place is making me feel so much freedom and that there's hope for tomorrow. And I want to give this another go. If that's you, will you just raise your hand where you're at? I just want to pray over you and pray with you. If that's you, you want to like, you want to start or restart life in Jesus. Who is that? I really, okay, awesome. One, so good. So good. Is there, is there another? I really feel like that's somebody here. Okay. It says that, it says that in heaven, when, it, when anyone turns towards the Lord, there's more joy in heaven in that moment. Can we just rejoice with our sister over there? Awesome. I bless you. I bless you. I bless you. Yeah. Santana, Santana, I just want to, I just want to release a word over you. Um, even, even that name um, reminds me of the word saint. I don't know if that's the, the, the origin of it, but I just want to release um, the identity of being a holy one over you. Uh, and I just, uh, I release the full, um, the full cleansing of Jesus, the washing of his blood and water over your life right now. Um, and I feel like, uh, I feel like that, that word from 2 Corinthians 5 is being released over your life, that old things have passed away, all things are becoming new and we're talking about we're talking about like a, a line in the sand moment where there's nothing from yesterday that you need to hold on to in the going forward and that as you walk forward you're going to feel like where where did these shackles go where were the things where were the things and they were largely in your mind um lies that you had believed like relational things like i'm not good enough i'm not worthy enough to to really be loved like this and i really feel like he's releasing that confidence over you bless you bless you I want to encourage you, if that's you, you guys, this morning, you want a word, you need you need a transition, a turning point with Jesus, just get up here with one of our, our prayer ministers. Are you guys okay? Awesome. Bless you. Bless you, bless you. Amen, amen. Can we thank Pastor Sean for that word? 